All right, turn your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. This will be our last installment of the appearances of Christ. And then we're going to go next week, Lord willing, to uh, the Feast of Pentecost. We'll be going back to the feast days and hopefully finish that up in three or four weeks. And uh, so we're looking forward to that. Um, this is the first time I've got to go through that beginning before Resurrection Sunday and going through that in a systematic way. And it's, it's, it's been a help to me, if nothing else. So I appreciate that. All right, Acts chapter 1, verse number 1. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, was given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Brother Kelly has taught really uh, in depth on that. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now keep in mind, every time we read that, the not many days hence is talking about the Feast of Pentecost, which is coming. Okay, so we're looking at how the Savior walked for 40 days upon this earth and showed himself to his believers. Uh, not to the world, didn't do miracles and all those things. He just showed himself to his believers. And in that time, he showed them, what have I said every time? He showed them that God always keeps what? His promises. He always keeps his promises. There's never a promise that God made that he cannot keep and will not keep. And just because he hasn't maybe kept it yet, doesn't mean it's not coming. And so I have a friend, his name is... Um, um, Melvin Daniel, he pastors a church in Kentucky, and his uh, he's been he prayed for his sister for twenty years that God would convict her and that she would she would get saved. And then one year he went up to a church in in the town that she lived in and preached in the church. She came to the service and got saved. Twenty years of praying, Amen. And God promised that He would save those that would come. It's not on God's side. He promised he would. And so he keeps his promises. He did die on the, on the Feast of Passover. He was buried on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And he rose the third day on the Feast of First Fruits. I get a little bit excited every time I, I read that. that. That's exciting to me. Now, the book of Acts and the resurrection tells us that he assembled together for 40 days. We talked about... Forty days being a time of, of testing, a time of trial. And he did that for his disciples and showed them pictures of things that were now and were to come. And so we see that. And we do believe that the resurrection is essential. Essential for you to be saved. It is part of the finished work that Christ did for us. It is the gospel. And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that you can't be saved aside from the gospel. Amen. It is the good news. You put your faith and trust in what he did in the gospel and the, the death, the burial and the resurrection. So thankful that we have that. Now, in these appearances, we see these pictures and we've seen so far. And we do know that God has a heavenly people. That is the church, he, uh, the body of Christ. He has saved us. We are going to be with him in heaven. We're already the Bible says we're already spiritually in Christ and seated with him in heavenly places. And then there is an earthly people, which is the Jews. And God has not forgot the Jews, and he will keep his promises to the Jews. Uh, that's also exciting. Amen? And so that will happen. And so we looked at that through the covenants. We looked at that through the feast days. And, uh, and so far we've looked at after he resurrected the appearances. We saw that he appeared to Mary Magdalene. He showed her that there is a new family. He showed the women that came to the tomb to anoint the dead body, a new kingdom. He showed Peter, Simon Peter, a new advocate. There's no, listen, 
I'm going to say this over and over here. God is not mad at you. God doesn't like sin. And it grieves the Holy Spirit when we do sin. And it disappoints God that we sin. But He is not so mad at you that He will not let you return. And He is His desire to restore you. He made the initiative to Peter. And any time that you've been off in sin, He will make an initiative to get you back. He loves you. And He wants you in, in the right place. And He did that for Peter. And it was a private meeting with Peter. And, uh, and He will meet with you privately. Uh, then He met with the two on the road to Emmaus. And showed them that he, they, are, they saw his kingship, they saw his, that he was a prophet, but they weren't looking at him being the, the high priest. And we have a continual high priest uh, that lives for us. He's alive. And then we also seen last week that uh, to those behind the door that we have a new propitiation. He is the payment for sin. And, uh, and uh, he lets us know that and we're in a relationship with him because of that. And then today we're going to look in John chapter 20 at the sixth appearance, and then we're going to stop there. We could go on with some more, but we're just going to stop right there and show you this in John chapter 20 and verse 26. Now we know last week we looked at that he appeared to those in that room that were shut behind the door and what he showed them in that room. And, but Thomas was not there. And so we pick up when, when, when we see Thomas, and we'll look at that. The Bible says in verse 26, And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Now Thomas is with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered, said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, and hast believed, uh, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. Isn't that wonderful words? I love the Bible. I love the language of the Bible. It's just, it's just poetic in all that it says and speaks to our hearts. He loves us. He gave us a book to let us know that He loves us. And then when He saved us, He put the Holy Spirit inside of us to let us constantly know that He loves us. Now, to whom did He appear? We've looked at this each time. Primarily, He appeared to Thomas. I believe this meeting was primarily for Thomas. The others had met a week earlier, and Thomas was not there. And so primarily, I believe this meeting was for Thomas. He came again into the same room and met with them again and spoke directly to Thomas. <coughs> in the other meeting, he spoke to everyone. In this meeting, he spoke primarily to Thomas. And so we see that. Supporting, there were others there also. Uh, and, I, and I'm going to tell you in a little bit why I think they were there. Uh, and it was primarily for joy. Here is one of their brothers being restored and so we see this truth there. Okay? Now, I have said some things about Thomas that I, after studying this, I still see some of that, but I, I see it a little different now. So I want to share that with you. Uh, and so, we, we know what took place the week before. We've seen that. We've seen that the room was filled with people because of, fear, uh, because of their fear for the Jews. They were there, I believe, Watching the door, praying, Jesus came in the room and eased that. And then with joy, they went out and found Thomas. And cared about Thomas enough to tell him, we have seen the Lord. And now, uh, seven days later, here is Thomas in the room with them. He came to see what they saw. Okay? 
and, and Jesus comes in the room. Now, Thomas was not there. And uh, when Jesus departed the room, they went and found him and told him that. But Thomas made some demands. They said, we've seen the Lord. And this is what he said to them. Verse number 25. Except I shall see his hands, uh, see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Thomas made some demands to the believers that saw him. What you saw, I will not believe unless I both see and feel him. I won't believe. Okay? Why wasn't Thomas there the week before? Why wasn't he there? Thomas is mentioned four different times in the book of John, and I believe in those four times we can see, or at least two of those times, we can see uh, his attitude, and we can see why he wasn't in the room. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, and look with me at verse 30. We're going to build this through this just a little bit. John chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus came to the Jews and began to show them that he and the Father were one. Verse 30, I and my Father are one. Now, how did they react? Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. <laughs> they said, we'll just take you out of this world because you're blasphemous. They did not believe that he was the Son of God or the Messiah or that he and the Father were one. Look down at verse 39. Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped uh, out of their hand and went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized, and there he abode. So they took up stones to stone him. They threatened him again to stone him, and he left and went on the other side of Jordan. Then look in verse, chapter 11. Turn a page there and look in chapter 11, verse 1. The Bible says, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. In parentheses, it says, It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Now look in verse 6. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. So Jesus held his coming. He held back for two days and didn't come. Look in verse 7. Then after, uh, that, then after that saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee. And goest thou thither again, thither again? They said they was going to st stone you when we were there. Are you going back again? Now look in verse 16. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto the fellow, uh, fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. There's statements from Thomas that we can kind of pick up where he's at. Number one, uh, we can know for sure he wasn't a coward. He wasn't afraid to die. He said, let's go. But I'm going to say something to you. Courage does not equate faith. You can be courage, you be full of courage and be selfish in it. I believe faith will make you courageous, but courage does not always equate to faith. There have been many, Brother Kelly can tell you, some of these people that served in the military, and Brother Kelly's a historian, and so he can tell you, there's been many people that, that did courageous acts that if they died, they'd went to hell. It doesn't equate. You can be courageous and still be worldly. Okay, so he was courageous, and I don't believe that he was scared enough to be in that room. 
But there's some other things about him that shows up. Number one, he was a pessimist. He was a doubter. He gets that name because it's in the scripture. He's a doubter. He thought they were all going to be stoned if they returned. You know, there's things that happen in this world and that the natural eye sees, but we live by faith. And God can change the situation. He is the common denominator that can make things different. And Thomas failed to see that about him. He said, let's just all go die. Christ had already told him, I'm going to die on the cross, not by a stone. And yet he, he, didn't, he just doubted that everything was the way the Lord said. Turn to chapter 14. Let me show you this. John chapter 14. This is a very uh, familiar passage of Scripture. Verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Now listen to this part. That where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way, you know. Now listen what Thomas says. Thomas saying to him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? He said, what you just said, Lord, is not so. I doubt that. I, I, don't, I don't think we can know the way, even though the Lord told him himself. I'm going to tell you something. If the Lord said it, we can count on it. It's so. And whether we see it, whether we feel it, whether we touch it, it's still so. And we can believe it. But Thomas was a pessimist. He just, he didn't believe that. He was ignorant. It wasn't that Christ hadn't taught them, he had. But he was ignorant of the word of God. I'm going to say something to you you don't even realize. You have been blessed, not because of me, but you have been blessed to be in a church that faithfully teaches the Word of God. That I'm going to tell you something, and I'm not putting off on people, but I have heard so much ignorance coming from the pulpit. But you haven't had that. You've had men of God and teachers of God that stood in this church and faithfully taught you the Word of God. Doctrine, deep doctrine, things that sometimes a little hard to take at first, but, it, but it, it sinks in there. And can you imagine, Brother Kelly, walking with Christ and Him telling you? Now, I'm going to say this. They didn't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them like we do, but they had Christ. And He was, he was willfully ignorant of what Christ had told Him. They could know it. They just refused to. They, they, all they could see was, he's with me now. He's with me now. He's with me now. And most of them thought he would bring the kingdom in now. And was not looking by faith to try to learn what he was telling them. He told them, I'm going to die. I'm going to resurrect. I'm, you know, he told them all those things. And so he was ignorant of the word of God. And yet, and not only was he ignorant of the word of God, but he was unbelieving of the word of God that he actually heard. And so Thomas, not only was he a pessimist, but he was unbelieving and he was doubtful of the Word of God. Then, not only that, but he was not about his, his Savior's business. You remember when, the, when the, the week before when all of them met together? When they saw the Lord and everything was said to them that the Lord said, what did they do? They immediately went out and told others, we have seen the Lord. They, 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 they began to be about the practice that he told them to do. He said, there's a plan. The, Lord, the, the Father sent me, I send you. Now go out and tell them. The first one they went to was Thomas. They went out to, see, to find Thomas to, to assure him that they cared about him. They, and that the Lord cared about him and that the Lord was back. Thomas wasn't about that, but they were. Amen? You remember, when, uh, uh, you remember when the Lord washed their feet? 
He told them, I have washed your feet, now you go wash others' feet. You care about others. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. The Bible teaches us that when we have been with the resurrected Savior, when we have been with the living Savior, we'll start to care more about Him, more about His church, more about those that are not where they ought to be. And so the first place they went was to Thomas. Now, he's operating in the flesh. John chapter 20, verse 25. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord, but, uh, but he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. So number one, he said, I have to see it, and I have to feel it. I have to see it, and I have to touch it. That's worldly thinking, by the way. That's not how the the body of Christ thinks. That's how the world thinks. That's why all this stupid evolution stuff is here. They want to be able, and they can't even, there's no, they have, it takes more faith to believe what they believe than it does what we believe because we have a written word. But they said, if I can't see it, if I can't touch it, it can't be real. And that's what Thomas was saying. If I can't see it, if I can't touch it, it's worldly thinking. And he said, if I can't do that, I won't believe. No faith. That's the language of the world. That's not the language of a Christian. That's the language of the world. And Thomas said, I have to, I have, to have these things or I will not believe it. Now, you remember when, when Christ was uh, 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 working and, and the miracles began to uh, cease and he was more teaching the people in, in uh, John chapter 6, um, some of them went away when all that stopped. They left him. And this is what I said. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you go away also? It's worldly thinking. If, you can't, if I can't see it, if I can't touch it, if it's not something that's benefiting me right now, I'm not going to believe. But Peter answered this. He said, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, I don't have to see it, don't have to feel it. I believe, I'm assured of it. Amen? We're assured of it. Listen to me, if you think this coronavirus was hard times, it's not. It was hard. It was tough to go through. But it's not the hardest time this world's going to see. We're not going to be in the tribulation, but I believe there's going to be hard times come. And we're going to stand for our faith. We're going to stand for our faith. And Thomas was not willing to do that. He had the language of the world. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Brother Kelly taught that when he was teaching in the book of Hebrews. He said, that's how faith behaves itself. When you, when you see someone with faith, that's how the, it behaves itself. They, we believe things we have not seen. Nobody here, nobody here has seen the resurrected Savior. Amen. And yet we believe and we are assured that He is who He said He was. Amen. Amen? Thomas was not willing to do that. And again, I know he did not yet have the Holy Spirit in him, but he had Christ. He had something we didn't have. He saw the resurrected Christ. And so he he had that. Now, I believe, I believe this. I believe that disappointed the Lord. And I believe he came back the seven days later to show him and restore him back to where he wanted to be. I don't believe God is mad at us, but I do believe that it disappoints God when we fall off into sin. And the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. And so... I see that. Now, notice what Jesus said and did. Number one, he showed up seven days later. He showed up. He will always show up. Amen. This is the sixth appearance. Six is a number for man. Six is a number for 
uh, uh, failure. And so he showed up the sixth time in that room to a doubting man named Thomas who needed restoring back to believing. And he showed up there, one believer, doubting, faith, lacking Thomas, he showed up in that room to him. Amen? He deeply cares for our state. He deeply cares for our state. Amen? Any man that doesn't care how his wife is feeling probably doesn't love her. Any woman that doesn't care about how her husband is feeling probably doesn't love her. Now, not every moment, but on the whole. Christ cares where we are. He cares about our heart. He cares about our state. He cares about our living. He cares about that. And he proves it when he shows back up to him. Amen? Romans chapter 5. I love Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 verse 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more. Now this is what the Christian has. Much more then being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. He's alive and He cares for us. He's alive and He cares for Thomas and He shows up in that room. Amen? If you're lost, he wants to save you more than you want to be saved. If you are br broken in your fellowship with Him, He wants to restore you more than you want to be restored. What a Savior. Then He gives him an invitation. Look in, cha in chapter 20, verse 27. Then saith He to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. I believe that he's telling him, go ahead, see and feel. If that's going to make you feel better, go ahead and do that. And it, it equates to come, repent, come to me. Now, we have no evidence, no writing that Thomas ever did that. We don't know if he touched him or not. But he was invited to. Did you know that when you're not right with him, he's always inviting you to come back? Always. When you have doubt in your mind, he's always inviting you back to faith. When you have things going on in your life that's causing you to act perverted and contrary to what a Christian acts, he's always inviting you to come back. And he tells him, come back, repent. You know what this was? He's showing him this is the receipt. I'm showing you this is the receipt of what I paid to save you. This is the receipt of the finished work, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. I love this. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power when He had by Himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 10, 12. But this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God. It is finished. Brother, Brother Mike, he would have no right to sit down on the right hand of the Father had he not paid the price. But he paid it in full. And he's showing Thomas, I paid it in full. You're mine. Amen. You're mine. He was seated because it was done. Fully paid. He had the right to be seated because he paid the price. Hebrews 6.20, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest 
forever after the order of Melchizedek. There's an old Kentucky town. I heard a preacher tell this one time. And they had an express mail train that came through. It, it, it flew. I mean, it was just fast. It would come through every day. But before it came through, hours before it came through, there was an old, old engine that would come through. And when that engine came through, they knew that the train would be not shortly behind that. You know what they called that old engine? John the Baptist. He was the forerunner of the fast train. <laughs> Amen. And John the Baptist came and said, make, make the way. He's coming. And he came and he died and he rose again. And he said, I have paid the price. Amen. He's the forerunner. And he sat down on the right hand of the Father. Amen. His presence there lets every blood-bought child of God know he paid the price. And it's paid for our sins. He bore the marks of the finished work in his hands and his side. Now look at Thomas's response in verse 28. We don't know if Thomas touched him or not, doesn't say. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. That's the language of worship. No longer is he speaking the language of the world, but now he's speaking the language of worship. Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9. And I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of an angel. <laughs> which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and thy brethren, uh, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. We're not here to worship Kelly Whitey or Steve Hensley or the church. We're here to worship God. And if an angel were to appear in this room, we're not to worship him. We're to worship the one who finished the work, and that's Christ. And now Thomas is speaking the language of worship. Amen. Now, I believe this, and I'll finish with this. If you want to argue, you can, but not to me, somebody else. Thomas is a picture here of the unbelieving Israel also. Okay, and here's, here's how. Number one. He showed up seven days later. Thomas was unbelieving for seven days. Okay? There's a time of tribulation coming this seven years. Brother Kelly is covering those things, and he'll cover it really good, and I'll cover it too. We're not trying to compete with one another. We're trying to get you the Word of God. And so we'll cover that. But the tribulation period was seven years. Israel, it's a time for, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble, which is Israel. And Israel will go through that seven years of tribulation and come out the other side what? Believing. Now they are unbelieving. But through that tribulation period, they will come out believing. And so, seven days he was in unbelief. Hosea 3, 5. Afterward, shall the children of Israel return and seek Seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall hear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. At the end of that tribulation period, there's going to be a judgment of nations. Those, uh, those that are saved will go into the millennial reign alive and there'll be a resurrection of Old Testament saints at the end of that tribulation period and God will restore Israel. And so he's a picture of that. Of that. Now listen to this. There were others. It's also a picture of of the others who were rejoicing during that time. That's the body of Christ, the church. While, while they're on the earth during the tribulation period, guess what we're doing? We're in the presence of Christ. That's where they were, in the presence of Christ. And rejoicing over that. We're rejoicing. Now we're going to go through the judgment seat of Christ. Don't take the judgment seat of Christ that He's judging us for our sins. He's not. He's judging us for our works. And hopefully there'll be many crowns on that day. And it will turn out to be a rejoicing time because we're in the presence with Christ. Amen? Now, I'm going to show you something and I'll be through. The Bible calls him, not just us, Didymus. Didymus means twin. 
Okay? So Thomas had a, also the word Thomas means twin. But he had, a, he had a twin somewhere. We don't know about his twin. Some people think it's Matthew and, and different things. I, that's just supposition. We don't know. But he had a twin. What that pictures to us is that one day we will be together with Israel in the millennial reign. Twin worship. We'll be together with them celebrating that Christ has come back to the earth. Amen? Ruling and reigning with Him. And so we see that wonderful picture of that. The Bible says He's coming back. The Bible says those of us who are saved will come back with Him and rule and reign on this earth and live here for a thousand years. Amen? At the end of that thousand years, we have a new Jerusalem that's going to come down. When you go to heaven now, you're not going the streets of gold and pearl and all that. You're not. It's, I'm sorry. You're not. But you'll be in the presence of the Lord, which is much better. But when he comes back and after the thousand years, he will bring that down. Now, let's look at another picture he shows here. Look in verse 29. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me and hast believed, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Now, who's he talking about there? He's not talking about those believers because seven days earlier they saw him. <laughs> He's talking about us who have trusted him by faith. You haven't seen the resurrected Savior. You saw his book. You believed his book. You, you, you felt the conviction that the Holy Spirit drew you to him. You felt that. But you haven't seen him. And yet you believe. Amen. Hey, man, that's making me happy. Amen? That's making me happy. We haven't seen Him, yet we believe. I'm going to tell you something. I've never been faced with a gun in my face to say, do you believe or not believe? If you don't believe, I'm going to take your life. Like that young girl did at Columbine, or like other believers have in our Baptist history, I've never been faced with that. But I hope, I hope that I can stand there with joy in my heart and say, I have believed. I have believed, and I do believe, and I will continue to believe. And you can't Shake my faith. Because it could come. But if it doesn't come, I'm as sure going to be in heaven as he told me so in his Bible. And I believe, I'm like Paul when he stood on that ship and it was about to break to pieces. He said, I believe God. <laughs> Amen. I believe God rather than men. And I believe this truth. Blessed are they that have seen or have not seen and yet believe. The body of Christ, the body of Christ and the greater part of it didn't see Him resurrected, but they believed Him by faith. Amen? Amen. Amen. Boy, I wish I could, I wish I could get into a little Baptist history right there, but I won't for time's sake. Many of those died at the stake, singing with their flesh melting off their bodies from fire singing and looking toward heaven. Many of them put on racks and stretched out and said, if you deny Christ, we'll let this up. And they said, don't let it up. We've never seen Christ as fully as we see Him now. Wow. I'm saved the same as they are. You're saved the same as they are. You love the Lord today. Would you let him save you? If you're not saved, would you let him save you? And if you are saved, would you let him restore you? Maybe some part of your life in your relationship with Christ is lacking. It may not believe that, it may not be that you're as far as Thomas or Peter was, but he loves you just as much. And it's his desire to restore you into fellowship with Him. Amen? Would you, would you take time today, like that old song we sing, take time to be holy. Take time to look inside. Take time to look at Him and get those things settled. I'm going to ask everybody to stand and ask Miss Hannah to come to the piano.